it's strange to be on the other side of this. Yeah, I was, I was also thinking this is probably the only time that people are going to see you without your like green screen background in. This is like yeah. it's the real Mark Brown <laughs> in his real environment, <laughs> his natural environment. <laughs> Hello everybody and welcome to another Thinky Games interview. It's been quite a long time since we did the last one. I've been trying to bring them back. Uh, but today I am delighted to be joined by Mark Brown from Game Makers Toolkit and developer of Mind Over Magnet. Hey Mark, how's it going? Hello, I'm good thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. Would you be able to introduce us to yourself? I'm sure lots of people who are watching already know who you are, but yourself, what you do and a bit about Mind Over Magnet? Uh, yes, so I have been running uh, Game Makers Toolkit, a YouTube channel about game design for uh, just coming up for 10 years now. Wow. Uh, so it's a channel about how games are designed, how they're made, um, level design, mechanics, so on and so forth. And it's all been based up until kind of this point on me looking at uh, existing games and analyzing them and researching them and interviewing the developers. But I thought it was about time that I made my own game and saw what is the process like? <laughs> what can I learn from, from that? And how can I apply all of these lessons to making my own thing? So I decided to make a puzzle platformer called Mind Over Magnet. And it's been in development for just over three years now. And it is finally Done. I was taking a look at when you put out that first video where you said, oh, I'm changing things up a bit. I'm going to start working on the game. And it was like just over three years ago. Do you remember, mm. can you cast your mind back and think like what was going on at that time? And what were you thinking about? What, what kind of game were you thinking about making back then? Well, a big thing was that I had um, the previous year mm -hmm. reached a million subscribers on YouTube, which was like amazing, was super mm -hmm. exciting. But I also kind of immediately made me just kind of think, think like, well, what do I do now? What's what's kind of what's next? I was kind of struggled to figure out what was going to be exciting and interesting mm -hmm. to me. Uh, you know, it kind of felt like I'd, I'd reached this nice moment, this this sort of finished this challenge of of doing YouTube. So thought for a while, like what would be like an interesting new challenge for me, and this seemed like something I'd been thinking about for a long time, but also kind of scared about and had been putting off for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and it was like, well, no time like the present. Let's try and actually. Um, <laughs> make this game and and go for it. In terms of the what type of game, mm -hmm. I mean, I the idea was to make something very small, mm -hmm. very short, yep. kind of bad, was, was I was okay with, but um, <laughs> as often happens, it, you know, ambitions and, and, and things start to, to swell and ended up taking far, far longer than I ever, ever intended it to, but uh, that's just kind of how these things go, I guess. When I was watching that uh, first video, I uh, did notice that you were talking about the game as though it was going to be a tiny little thing. I think you say something like, oh, I might publish it on itch.io or whatever, like, like you're mm. clearly thinking it was a tiny little project. Was there a particular point where it suddenly changed or could you just not control yourself? That's a good question. I don't remember there being like a specific moment, but mm -hmm. I think there was like a couple things. One was just like, the longer it took me to make the game, the more I felt like there was going to be this pressure for the game to be good. And so then I needed to work more on the game to reach those expectations. And it just created this vicious cycle where I am just could never finish the, the, the damn thing and had to just essentially put my foot down and say, Let's, we've got to stop this, otherwise I'll never finish it. <laughs> but I think it's also, it's just this, it's this piece of advice that is given to everyone who makes, you know, first time making a game, is make something really small, make something really low scope, finish it in six months to a year. But it's also the piece of advice that literally everyone ignores because mm -hmm. you start building it and you start getting excited about it and you start, you know, going, oh, this could have a hundred levels and a whole storyline and you just, it just, it's, it's hard to, that, that, that is like a real skill to learn mm -hmm. is how to reduce the scope, how to finish things and stop things. And so you're not going to learn that on the first game and it, it's just naturally going to spiral out of control. I wonder if to some degree 
even though you're inevitably going to expand your scope. Having the small scope to, scope to start off with at least lets you end up with just a three-year scope by the end of it, rather than something that ends up being a 10 to 20-year project or something like that. Yes, I think uh, the one kind of advantage I, I had was I, I had seen the the horror stories of people trying to make a you know a massive mm -hmm. MMO in, uh, for their first game or, or some huge sprawling thing. Um, so I knew that there was at least the, the sort of genre and the, the style and stuff I picked being a 2D game was going to limit me um, and, and stop it being like a 10 year game. Yeah. There was no temptation to make it a huge MMO? No, I don't no. think that would <laughs> suit the, the genre. But, you know, n never say never. Exactly. I can imagine a little uh, puzzle platformer MMO. I'm not sure what that would be at all. So there's obviously a kind of portal like inspiration. I guess any game that feels like it's made up of like puzzle chambers that you move from one to the next kind of feels like it has origin in Portal. I also kind of get Elekhead vibes from this as well. Like what other games were you thinking of when you were starting to design this? Well at the start it was m supposed to be more of a platformer. That was kind mm. of the original idea. Was it was thinking about things like Celeste, Super mm. Meat Boy, Mario games. And that was kind of my original vibe. But over time the genre kind of changed. Mm. The big change was so originally it was going to be the character was magnetic and you'd ride up and down these fields and stuff. But I sure. made a prototype where I split them into two things. There'd be a character and a magnet and you pick them up and that felt much better, but it also made it feel much more like a puzzle game. You're mm -hmm. figuring out where to put these two things and work on them. So that's where it became more of a puzzle platformer. And then, yeah, in terms of the games, Portal definitely was the, the biggest influence. And it was, it was actually kind of nice to have um, a, a good game that already exists that I could whenever I had like a design challenge, I could think, well, at least I've got like the portal answer. I can use that even if I change it slightly <laughs> or go in a different direction. I've got this kind of starting point, which you wouldn't get if you had, you know, you're trying something completely brand new. Uh, a Leghead is a funny one in terms of, I think the game was either announced or at least I found out about it shortly after I started working on the mm -hmm. game. And it was like, oh no. This game looks very similar to mine. It's about a little robot guy solving puzzles, throwing things. It was a bit of a challenge, and to the point where I didn't play a Leckhead when it came out, even though it looked like totally my type of game. This mm -hmm. looked like something I would love. I didn't play it for a long time. Slightly out of like jealousy, just because it looked so good. It was getting such good reviews. Um, and partly because I didn't want to sort of, you know, accidentally steal a load of ideas from it. Mm -hmm. But I did eventually play it and it's, it's very good. And it turns out it's functionally very, very different to this game. Yes, yeah. yeah. I, th I think um, Portal and Leckhead mm -hmm. existed on kind of a bit of a spectrum, two ends of a spectrum in one specific way, which is just how long you are in a puzzle scenario. So Portal has like the chambers and they're kind of like Mind Over Magnet where you have like an entrance and a distinct exit and there's like a transitionary period. Obviously in mm -hmm. Portal it's the, the elevator ride. Whereas a Leckhead is like bang, 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 bang with the puzzles, it's just screen to screen. Sure. That sort of um, thinking has been like a big part of making this game because uh, a Leckhead can kind of get away with slightly less involved puzzles because you're doing them so quickly okay the puzzle Very idea can be incredibly short mm -hmm. and it's just like straight on to the next one whereas in portal the chamber needs to be a little bit more involved and in depth because there's just something about the fact that it's like a thing mm -hmm. with this distinct middle and end uh, beginning middle and end mm -hmm. i grappled with that in this game of sometimes i felt like my puzzles weren't good enough to sort of need a whole level for them. So that was an interesting thing I had to, to grapple with. Right. Uh, another kind of interesting comparison is Portal, you're going from kind of chamber to chamber through a sequence of levels. Uh, Elekhead is more like, there's a bit more backtracking and you're kind of exploring a world and you decided to go with the more Portal-like approach. Could you talk a little bit about hmm. uh, your thoughts behind that and why, why you decided to go that direction? Yeah, it was something I did go back and forth on a, a Bit. There was mm -hmm. definitely some prototypes where I had um, a hub world where you could choose between levels. I thought about having like a right. wrap screen. A part of it was down to, I don't want to say laziness, but just <laughs> uh, it does it does definitely make game easier to make if you just have level after level after level, you yeah. don't have to think about that stuff. Yeah. But I also thought a lot about um, the kind of how I'm introducing different ideas mm -hmm. 
and the, the gradual rise in challenge and complexity and how the, the different mechanics kind of interlink and having that in a more open world or a sort of metroidvania type world or a, a map screen world makes things a lot more complicated and harder for uh, to kind of give that specific experience to the player so right. I felt like it was slightly more suitable for what I was working on to have it where it be I'm going to dictate the, the direction of the levels like if, if it's a open world you can't really control mm. the flow of what people are learning from one next one stage to the next yeah and like this this level you're you're, you're doing here like mm -hmm. it's teaching is really kind of important concept which i didn't even realize was something important i had to teach to players but after a lot of play testing i did this idea that you need to like leave magnus somewhere else turn the electromagnet mm -hmm. on and then go get him like that's a concept i need to teach but i, li I like the trick here is like you're, you're you set it up like this you're like okay i'll leave magnus right here by this little uh, passage that I need to go through and then you're like oh now I've lost him so you have to realize mm. that you take him up here and you've sneakily put this like long slope here to kind of mm. distance the place where you've got to put Magnus from where yeah. you would naturally put him yeah because I think the, the idea would be like oh I'll just put him just off to the side a little tiny bit but you yeah. put him on the slope and he slide, slide, slides straight back down to where you don't <laughs> want him yeah. um, and just kind of cheeky but this is like yeah an important concept and so it needed to be taught to the player before I could then do any other levels. And then if you had a, a map screen or, or whatever, you start getting out of out of whack. And so it just becomes a, an extra design challenge, basically, of, of knowing how to make sure you're always teaching the player things. And for my first game, I was like, whatever's easiest, whatever's most straightforward, I'm, I'm going for yeah. that. Okay, so speaking of first game, I was looking at your Wikipedia page, and it told me that apparently way back when, you might have released a game called Pixel This. Is this true? This is true. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Let's hear a bit about that. This is like a slight complication in the, the Mind Over Magnet origin story. A slight uh, tweak I have to make. Yeah. Mind, uh, Pixel Sorry, this I'm ruining is... your story. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's something I do have to deal with. Pixel This is um, uh, basically uh, Picross, you know, yeah. the nonograms thing. Um, way, way back at like when the iPad first came out, there were no good Picross games. So mm -hmm. I was like, I should. I should make one. And I did like, you know, release, finish it, release it, put it on the app store. The reason I don't really think of it almost as like my first game is just because I didn't invent Picross, I didn't design. Sure. It's just like, it was almost more like an app than a, than a game in my eyes. Also, I didn't really, it was so long ago mm -hmm. that I completely forgot all of the lessons I learned to it. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, it was, uh, I was proud of it. It released, it was free, but it had in-app purchases, it made, enough money to be able to like pay my Apple development license for a few years <laughs> nice. before then I then it ran out and so I, <laughs> I'm not paying like 70 quid a year whatever it is to Apple to keep it on the App Store and right so it's the, no longer uh, there nobody upkeep. can play it anymore no longer there Sally I, I think I have like a an iPod touch in my drawer mm -hmm. that has it on and every now and again I just have to like recharge it to keep it alive because <laughs> otherwise I'll never be able to play it again so something I'm interested in is Throughout the entire time you've been doing GMTK, you clearly have a particular interest in puzzly, thinky, uh, problem-solving types of games. Even, even the games that aren't like on the surface puzzly games, you, you're often talking about the systems and, the, and some puzzly aspects of them. So I'm kind of curious, what is, what, what is it that you think attracts you towards those games and talking about those aspects of them? Yeah, I suppose I haven't like, really thought about that before, but I mm. suppose you're right, even in things like Zelda games, mm -hmm. I'm very interested in like the dungeon designs mm -hmm. and the sort of non-linear level design that you're using maps and things. I have always been draw drawn to games that are more thinky based, thoughtful based, where I like like things like detective games mm -hmm. for that, that reason. I think it's just like there are aspects of games that make them different to other mediums and sometimes that's highly challenging input-based things, and I like that too. I, I, mm -hmm. I love like Mario games and Tony Hawk's games for that. But the idea of a game being able to challenge your logic skills or your spatial reasoning skills is something you, you just cannot get anywhere else. And so I've always found that fascinating. Um, and I, yeah, just, I just like solving puzzles. I'm like a great puzzle solver. <laughs> like, you know, all the games like Drakneck, mm -hmm. uh, I'll get like a few worlds in and then go, oh no, um, this is beyond <laughs> me now. Or, I've never finished Steven Sausage Roll and things like that. You should get to it. Yeah, maybe I should. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now that you've finished this, go straight back to Steven Sausage Roll and finish that. That will be my, my <laughs> post-game reward to myself is finishing that game. Yeah. 
like so I like the the feeling of solving puzzles, but I'm not like the the guy who's getting super in, in depth into Barbara's you and stuff. Right. Okay. I was going to mention this in this puzzle here. This is like a classic puzzle setup where you're, you're using you're putting an object on a bridge and then dropping it from from the bridge to land on the thing. It's funny, you see the certain puzzle types like this that you see repeating throughout various puzzle games. Did you have that mm. feeling when you made this puzzle? Like, oh, this is like, this is something that I've seen before and it's like such a kind of core puzzle idea, I might as well include it. I think uh, that came after making it. Like I made it and was like, this is really cool. And then mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I think this is in Portal 2, where you make the, the light bridge with the right. box. Right, you put and the light bridge with the box on it, and then you make the light bridge disappear. Like, it is such a recurring yeah. theme. And I, I think it's really nice to have those recurring themes that you see across different puzzle games. It's like, oh, this is yeah. feels like home. Yeah, yeah. And there's like the earlier one where it's not even really a puzzle, just leaving Magnus on the button. Like, you press the button mm. yourself, and then you realize, oh, it's a, I need to hold it down. So you, that, that's in a lot of other games. Yep. But there were some puzzles where I started working on them and was like, I've seen this too often and I don't want to put this in the game. Interesting. Um, a classic one is this one where you have like, you have like maybe three buttons and one button activates A and C, the other button activates C and B, and you have to kind of like figure out the right combination. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I've seen that in so many games. <laughs> I don't want to do that again. Like I just mm -hmm. want to, inevitably there will be puzzles that have been repeated and um, hopefully I've put like enough of a spin on them because, because it's a magnet or whatever it's, it's slightly different but yeah, yeah. I mean that's it's, certainly it's, the only one so far that I feel like that. I mean I guess yeah putting the thing on the button but that is just teaching the basic mechanics of, of mm. the game in fact a lot of um, puzzle games that have buttons that effectively open gates in this case it's lifting an object but it's opening a gate after that puzzle they'll do a puzzle where you like put the object on a button then you have to go to the other side of the gate put a different object on a different button to keep the gate open from that side, go back to the first side to grab the thing. And I actually like that you didn't do that. It kind of feels like you just kind of went, they get the concept, they know how to open or put things on buttons. Let's move on to the next puzzle. It's definitely appreciated. <laughs> yeah, I, I tried to um, not repeat myself too much. I didn't want to slow the pace down. Mm -hmm. There was probably a version of this game that was twice as long, you know, with slight variations of the puzzle, but tried to make sure every room was kind of somewhat unique, you know, I wasn't repeating myself too much. Mm -hmm. So that was, yeah, definitely a, a goal. Yeah, awesome. So another interesting thing with your circumstances is that you have a huge audience of, of folks who follow, follow you on YouTube. How has that been in terms of development? Most people who are making a game don't have that. Uh, I assume mm -hmm. it was really helpful for playtesting, or maybe it was like too much for playtesting. I'm also curious about whether there's any part of you that feels like because you, you know you, you made videos about uh, game design, people are going to be looking like too closely at this game and judging you because you were talking about game design and now you're making a game. Yeah, what are your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, you basically <laughs> nailed it there. Those are the two, <laughs> like the, pro, the, the pros and cons. And I think the pros definitely outweigh the cons. Like I mm -hmm. am making this game like in, in, on easy mode, essentially. Mm -hmm. There are not many developers who can make their character controller and then email the developers of Celeste and be like, what do you reckon? Is this, <laughs> is this good enough? Right. <laughs> or to interview uh, or email like, you know, puzzle game designers, the guy made Patrick's Parabox or mm -hmm. Dracneck and just get them to give me feedback has been incredible. Playtesting mm -hmm. has also been very good. That is something that I know a lot of developers, you know, it's, it's one thing in my videos to be like, you should play test your game as much as possible. You know, mm -hmm. every week get new people to play the game. Mm -hmm. And I get people replying like, who? Who is gonna, who's going to play my game? <laughs> Whereas for me, it's like I put a I put a tweet out and got like 500 people offering to play test, which is just like that's too many people. <laughs> so that's an incredible incredible problem to have. So yes, the, sure. the advantages are, are, are massive, and, and obviously just having that audience there yeah. too, who hope, hopefully fingers crossed will be there day one to mm -hmm. uh, to buy it. Um, mm -hmm. But it does come with the as you say the sort of the pressure and the expectations of. Um, you know, for one thing, I, I kind of feel like, you know, uh, a lot of developers have that sort of when they make their second game, they have that you know second difficult second album syndrome. It's why you know Notch has never made a game since Minecraft. I sure. reckon it's just because you've made that one big thing. It's like how do you ever follow that up? I kind of have that 
with my quote unquote first game. Um, <laughs> yeah, you can't say that. Worse. You've already done two games. <laughs> yeah, I know. My first real game. Um, yeah. My first Steam game. Yeah. But it kind of feels like my second game because there's that, all those expectations of, of the videos and stuff. And, and as you say, people are like, okay, you've been talking for you know all these years for how to make a great game. Let's see how good you actually are at doing this. And uh, that is a lot of expectation, a lot of pressure <laughs> to put on me. And that I think that has led to the game taking as long as it has. It's just like, I can't put out something terrible because that will <laughs> really just shoot my credibility. And so I've gotten to the point where I'm at least comfortable that it's not going to completely destroy every uh, you know, last piece of credibility that I, I have. Uh, we'll from, see. We'll yeah. see. Maybe. Yeah. From what I can tell, you will have no problems at all. It's um, I've I've because I've already played it a couple of times before, and you know it's great, and it was great then, and it's still great now, and it's it's even better because you've done all sorts of things to it. Um, Thanks. Speaking of which, one of the things you did earlier this year was it is you completely revamped the the art style because it was pixel mm. art before. It, I think yes. it just adds so much more to the polish. The fact that it's now like this kind of vector art. Um, mm. Are you are you glad you you made that that shift? Yes, definitely. Um, so it came out of like a technical headache of just pixel art. My pixel art was too big, basically. Like mm. if you make pixel art and it's really low resolution, like a sort of SNES game or whatever, it's it's really easy to make it fit on any screen resolution. But if, mine was like 720p pixel art, which is just mm -hmm. ridiculous. And it just made this massive headache of trying to get it to work on different screens. And so it was just like, the solution really would just be to scrap the pixel art and redo all its vector art. But that's a ridiculous thought. Yeah. And then just that then was then stuck in my head of like, oh, maybe, maybe I've just got to do this. And it didn't take as long as I thought it would because mm -hmm. the art is, is quite simple. It's not, you know, it's not like organic looking. It's because everything's quite mechanical and uh, boxy. It wasn't too bad to redo it all. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy with it. The, the one funny thing is the, the actual, the far backgrounds, like in this thing with the boilers and the coal, is still all pixel art. I just put a blur filter on it and hopefully oh, no one wow, notices interesting. it. Yeah, it definitely helps. But um, pixel art indie game is had already become a bit passe mm -hmm. years before I started working on mine. Maybe vector art indie game is, is already passe too, but at least uh, I'm happy with it and it does look quite nice. Yeah. I mean, there's only so many styles, <laughs> unless you're going to come up that's with a completely true, yeah. new one. Yes, that's true. I, I did also notice I was looking back some of your older videos that you did when you started making this, and it was a much darker game originally. Um, mm. It's way more vibrant and colorful now, and I guess the areas have more of a theme to them. So it seems like at some point you you were like, Ooh, we need to you know, spruce this up a little bit. Yeah, I think something I was always aware of or, or, or worried about was making sure that the important elements contrasted well against the stuff that's less important. Mm -hmm. And I felt like at the beginning, the, the, the solution to that was to make stuff super high contrast, lots of blacks and, and, and dark colors. But at some point just realized, oh, you can just, just put a big thick outline around things and that <laughs> solves the problem. And then you can use whatever colors you want. Um, because yeah. it's, to me now, look at, like looking at this, it's, it's very clear what is important and what is not. So mm -hmm. that was uh, a, an easy solution. I just didn't realize for, for a long time. Uh, I was very delighted to see that in the menu, there's a stuck option and then show hint. Uh, I remember, so mm. at EGX last year, you came over to the family gaming zone and uh, I was there doing some thinky game stuff. And I think we talked about hint systems at that time. I think I was saying like, generally, I think they tend to be a good idea because it just helps more people get through the game and enjoy the game. Um, so curious about your thoughts on adding a hint system and how that's gone and how it works, because I've not really looked at it. We can take a look at it now. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I'm actually really pleased with the hint system. Mm. So it's slightly different on different levels. So this one is a text-based one. Mm. So you, when you press that little thing or just hit okay. into it, Magnus says something. Others are more um, visual-based. So it's got like a dotted outline kind of telling you mm. not okay. what to do, but um, just kind of a setup that might help push you in the right direction. Sure. And what I've actually found from people, like I've had some play tests where people have turned on the hint seen that thing and then had the aha moment mm -hmm. even though i've given them a hint they feel like they've solved it themselves just because i'm not telling you exactly what to do it's just i'm just sort of giving you that nudge and they go oh now i understand and they kind of get like a a good feeling even though they've essentially had to debase themselves by getting a hint <laughs> um, so 
whatever I've done has, has worked quite well. Um, and so it's just a case of going through every level and, and finding something that will push you in that right direction, but without um, telling you. And because I've got the option to just skip the level entirely, I, I was like, it doesn't really matter if, if even with the hint, the player, the player can't figure it out. They can at least just skip that puzzle entirely. But yeah, um, and in terms of like the more sort of philosophical side of things, I do, you know, doing my channel and learning so much about accessibility and learning more about how how can we make games access, accessible to a wider range of people as possible. Like I have no qualms about giving hints or just letting you skip the levels. As long as you've enjoyed the game, then mm -hmm. like by all means, do whatever you need to do to, to actually enjoy playing it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and yeah, as you mentioned, there's also the option to skip a, a level as well, which is always n nice to see. I put the level skip on a time uh, timeout, mostly just because I realized then that the, the speed run strategy for the game would just be to instantly skip every level. And that seemed kind of sure. boring, so I made it so <laughs> you've got to wait like three or four minutes before that unlocks. So you have to make for more interesting speed runs. <laughs> I, I can use this as an ex excuse to talk about something, which is just the the, um, the concept of leaving the level was something mm. that, oh, man, of course, so many headaches. Because I'd have like just a door you'd go through to, to end the level, and then mm. endless playtest feedback of being like, well, how did the magnet get through the door? You left the <laughs> magnet somewhere else. Yeah. And then so I'm like, okay, maybe I have to have it where you have to bring the magnet to the end of every level, but then that massively restricted the puzzles I could make. And then just came to this idea of like, oh, you can like, pull this stopper out and it would just suck the magnet and the character into the next level and yeah. that was the solution that it needed. And it's interesting how sometimes the only thing you need is a visual thing. Like there's, there's, mechanically yeah. there's nothing about that, that that is relevant. It's just a visual of the magnet being pulled into the pipe after you've unplugged it and just the visuals changes everything. So one thing I was interested to ask you about is do you think that there are skills that you use while doing your videos for GMTK that apply to game development and design? And how did you use those skills? Where did they come in handy? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, the making a, well, in some ways, making a video, making a game are somewhat similar, but they're also <laughs> quite different in ways that is important to realize. One big thing is like making a YouTube video is such a quick turnaround. Mm -hmm. um, of making it that you can be like really messy with it you know you can throw your files just in a folder randomly and just mm -hmm. slap it together and it can it's it can be a very bespoke solutions for fixing things or, or you know slapping you know making a transition between two video clips or whatever it doesn't matter because you render it out export it to YouTube mm -hmm. and delete all those files and then move on to the next one whereas a game just because it lasts so much longer to make and it's and it's there's, you know, there'll be bugs at runtime and all these sorts of things. You just have to be so much cleaner and more efficient and mm -hmm. smarter about how you're doing everything. And so that was almost like I had to unlearn all my messy behaviors from YouTube and, <laughs> and be a, a smarter, better uh, person. So, uh, which has then fed back into YouTube of like, oh, if I, you know, in the way that I made all these tools for making levels more quickly in Mind Over Magnet, oh, I can like, make tools to make YouTube videos more quickly. So it's kind of almost more the other way around, mm -hmm. to be honest. So one thing that also stands out to me is a kind of a sense of, it's like kind of what people talk about as juice in video games and animation and tweening and all that kind of stuff. That seems to be a common parallel. And I noticed like immediately coming into this game, every time you come into a level, there's a little title transition that feels like something I might see in the GMTK video, for example. Mm. Uh, so it's interesting to see how those uh, aspects of making a video uh, apply to a, a video game as well. Yeah, in a way, yeah. There's like, in when you're making YouTube videos, like you never want to have the screen be static because mm -hmm. people just think their video player has stopped working. Sure. And so you just always want to have something moving on screen. And so I kind of felt the same with the game. Like I never wanted it to just look like a screenshot. So there should things moving in the background, particle effects. Yeah, fan of the corner, things like that. <laughs> yeah. Just to kind of keep things visually exciting and just make it feel more alive. Makes sense. So in kind of puzzle game design, there's, there's a 
you know, some people go for a more minimalist approach. And I guess that would be the Steven Sausage Roll approach. There's like one system and the game can be quite long, but it just explores that one system to a lot of depth. And then there are games that take a more maximalist approach. I think Barbara's You is a great example where uh, sure, there is this one core system, but the game is just throwing new words at you the whole way through. It's there's like new objects and characters that show up. They don't really need to be there, but they're there because it, you know, it, it, it just adds a little extra something to the game. I'm curious, where do you see yourself fitting on that that scale of minimalism versus maximalism? Did you have any uh, change your mind about that at any point during development? Yeah, I hadn't really thought of it in those terms, but mm. I suppose it definitely in my mind goes towards more of a maximalist approach. I'm always trying to give you more mechanics and ideas. When you have like a new thing, I will maybe give you two or three levels with that thing before they're trying to give you something else. I think I probably get that less from puzzle games and more from like Nintendo games and Super Mario mm. and stuff of just like always exciting to have something new to play with. In some ways, I slightly regret that I didn't mine more depth out of the more basic systems of the game, mm -hmm. but I do just kind of enjoy how fast a clip this game moves along and it doesn't feel like you're just kind of being like, okay, I've got to see the mm -hmm. 20 different variations on putting a magnet down in a, in a basic room. It's like, no, let's do that like twice and then start putting in lasers and things spinning around and, and stuff like that. Yeah, in terms of thinking about the core system, it's um, one of the things that is interesting to me is, you know, you have magnets that can lift up blocks and you have these kind of drill bits that come in and out. And in a, if you think about it too abstractly, you can think of those as being quite similar in the, you know, you press a button and the thing moves out of the way uh, and you press the button it comes back again. But the interesting thing you've used with the drill bits is that they take some amount of time to come back and go back in. I think whenever drill bits show up, that's like, that's usually part of the, the the premise of the puzzle is figuring out, okay, how do I use the timing of the drill bit uh, to explore some interesting puzzle idea. And then with the blocks you've got, uh, they can sort of squish you or you can ride them mm. like a elevator. So they have, yeah, slightly different things. I mean, the, the funny thing is there's no, uh, at one point in the game there was like a door, right? It was just a door that opened and closed. Mm -hmm. And I don't even remember why, but I just at some point I was like, well, I could just have drill bits everywhere. Like, that is also a door. <laughs> right. And, and it's like, it, otherwise I'm just kind of confusing the player and I might as well just have the, the, a fewer elements being, mm -hmm. you know, doing the same sort of thing. In one of your videos, it was probably a couple of years ago now, maybe, maybe a year ago, you talked about your approach to puzzle design and coming up with ideas. And you referred to Patrick Trainer's level idea strategy document. Uh, so Patrick Trainer, mm -hmm being the developer of Patrick's Parabox, um, and that included uh, a bunch of uh, ideas for coming up with levels and included ideas, not just Patrick's ideas, but ideas from like within the thinking community uh, all gathered together into that document. And at the time, you talked mostly about the matrix approach, right? Of like, you've got these mechanics and you're trying to say like, does this mechanic work well with this? And making sure you've got a level that explores that. I'm curious, did your approach to level design evolve from that point or uh, did you stick with that the whole way through? How did things evolve throughout the development of the game? Yeah, so I was glad to find that information just because mm -hmm. I find coming up with the puzzles idea is such a difficult thing. Mm -hmm. Like, it's all difficult. I find puzzle design very difficult, but just coming up with just an idea, like a starting point was, was hard. So that those ideas that, that sort of Patrick wrote and, and collated was very useful. I, I think over time, I just kind of try to boil it down into a smallest uh, like possible kind of template for myself so that when I started a new level I kind of knew where to go with it and it would be a bit easier so it was like every level should hopefully orbit around a interesting interaction or just like a cool thing you can do like in this one of just like I want to have it so um, Magnus is hitting one laser and the box is not hitting a laser or something like that. So that's like the starting point for the puzzle and then almost working backwards to how can I build something where the player doesn't immediately figure it out and has to do a bit of work to get to that point. Is there any opportunities for me to put in ways to throw the player off and have them make a wrong assumption? And then just the nightmare of tweaking it and getting the exact timings right and then running a play <laughs> test and people realizing that they can completely cheese the puzzle if they just run slightly faster than I was expecting mm. and having to redo the whole thing. But um, 
to be honest, I never found puzzle design easy at all, even with all the techniques that I learned. Even up to the very last point of the game, I was still just being like, this is so hard. <laughs> and I, I have ult ultimate respect for people who make good puzzles and good puzzle games mm -hmm. with like hundreds of puzzles in them, I have no idea. Just making these like 50 in this was like pulling teeth the whole time. Right. Uh, it actually reminds me, you, earlier on you said you don't think you're the best puzzle solver. Um, people talk about designing puzzles as almost its own kind of puzzle. Do you, do you have the same feeling when designing puzzles as you do when solving puzzles? Yeah, maybe, yeah. But it was also, that was also like slightly wrapped up together. The idea of puzzle difficulty was definitely something I struggled with, went back and forth on a lot. I felt a lot of the time like a puzzle needs to be really hard to be good and memorable and for the player to be like, oh yes, very well done, that was a great puzzle. And if it was too easy, they'd just sort of sail past it and wouldn't be happy with mm -hmm. the game. And, but then ultimately realizing that like, making hard puzzles is really hard and also quite restrictive on the types of people who are gonna play the game. And so it'd be, it was just worked better for me to make my puzzles slightly easier, even though uh, I felt like that was I don't know, going to lose me some props in the puzzle game community or whatever. <laughs> I have, there was a lot of weird feelings wrapped up in this, but I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm pretty happy with the point I got to where the game is, I don't think it's a particularly difficult game, but I think yeah. it's at least enjoyable. And I've you know, seen some people struggle through different bits of it and mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, at least, at least it's not like super easy. No, absolutely. Uh, and to be honest, the problem's really the other way around. There are too many puzzle designers making brutally hard games and mm. learning how to like make a, a nice balance like this where you know most people could pick up this game and progress through it and feel good about progressing through it is like the, one of the hardest things to do. I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that. <laughs> so when you were thinking about puzzles and interactions between mechanics and all that kind of stuff, were, were there any mechanics that you ended up just completely cutting out. I guess you got rid of doors. You gave us an example. Like, well, that, maybe that wasn't much of a mechanic, but were there any kind of core puzzle mechanics you ended up cutting out just because they didn't work for some reason? Is there anything you like really wished you could have kept? Yeah, I mean, I, I, a big one really is just the concept of uh, magnets um, repelling from mm. the opposite magnetic source. Uh, that's the code is in the game for that to work. Uh, if I, you know, flip a, a, a ball or whatever, it can turn it back on. Yeah. But it just became like a little bit too complex and a bit messy interactions and was just difficult to communicate that well to the player and cause issues. And so it just became cleaner to have it where a magnet just ignores mm -hmm. the opposite thing rather than being repelled from it. Um, and so I slightly regret that I wasn't able to properly explore that concept and I feel like there's probably a, a version of the game out there where it's more focused on the basic properties of magnetism. But other than that, there's like a conveyor belt in World 4 that, or yeah, World 4 that exists like, that was basically cut from the game. It's just, I put it in a cutscene just to make that cutscene a bit more interesting, but it's like, that should have been in the game and things like that. But for the most part, everything did end up in the game just because if I'd worked on it, it's like, I gotta get, I'll get my, <laughs> my money's worth out of this mechanic and I'm not gonna leave this in the cutting room floor. And I guess when you are taking a more maximalist approach, it's okay for a, a thing mm. to show up for a couple of puzzles then, uh, and then not appear later on. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I love all the little cutscenes you've now got in the game as well. And also the, the kind of motivational things that Magnus says as you're progressing through the levels, just says like, come on, let's go, all that kind of stuff. It's a good way of keeping the, the, the player moving forwards. Yeah, I enjoyed writing those. And that, that was like one of those fun things that you get from making games where it almost comes around like slightly by accident or, or not, not so much by accident, but with like, I built this cutscene system. And when I first made it, you know, I had that choice of either you could have like a box along the bottom of the screen with like a little character profile picture or whatever, or I could have it as, um, speech bubbles above the head, which caused a lot more problems because they've got to follow the character and resize and things. But I just thought it looked cooler. And then at one point, probably after playing Super Mario Wonder, where they have the, the flowers talking and having a similar sort of thing, being like, right. oh, I wonder if I could just have these speech bubbles appear outside of a cutscene, of just a little mm -hmm. bit of tweaking of code. And then, oh yeah, I can. And so that became a cool <laughs> thing to just being able to have those appear 
whenever you're playing. Had to make sure I didn't overuse it because I feel like that would have gotten really annoying if they're just constantly yabbering away to you. If you did the, the hey thing from Zelda. Hey. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and making sure, making sure they didn't give away puzzle solutions. <laughs> There's one in a, a much earlier puzzle you did, the one with uh, dropping Magnus um, off the bridge mm. onto the button. And he says like, oh, that was really clever or something. Yeah. And I had some feedback from people saying like, oh, that kind of like undermined my sense of satisfaction because the, the, the magnet like called me out of being clever and then it made me feel less clever or something. But, Interesting. Uh, so I tried not to do that too much, yeah. I love that it kind of blends, it, sorry, blurs the line between the cutscenes and the gameplay. It kind of feels mm. like the whole thing is a cutscene because you're always, the characters are always talking to each other even through the, the levels as well, which is really nice. Yeah. So one other thing I was interested to see is that in the menu, there's an option for developer commentary. Yeah, um, the, the reason I did it was a big inspiration for my whole channel was the developer's commentary in Valve games, in mm, Portal yep. and Half-Life uh, episodes and Team Fortress. That was the probably like the first moment where I realized game design is like a thing. <laughs> that it's there are these smart people sure. who are making puzzles and mm -hmm. directing you through levels with light and all of these sorts of crazy mm -hmm. psychological tricks I'd never considered before and it was mm -hmm. fascinating. And so in the last month of developing developing this game, it's like I've got a bit of time. This would be a nice full circle moment to have commentary in my game. Um, and so I uh, just those little switches in this level, I basically took one of those and slightly redesigned it to look like a speaker. And so they, I littered them throughout some of the levels and you just press it and it starts an audio recording of me just chatting about uh, making the game or the level that you're playing. Yeah, they're, they're not like super duper in depth because it's just me yabbering away into a microphone. <laughs> but, um, you know, because in, in the Valve ones, they sometimes like cut away to like an animation of Alex kicking a head crab or whatever. and I. I was like, I'm not, like, I'm literally... Because, <laughs> oh, man, the thing is, is no matter what cool thing you want to put in the game, um, it's just so much work. Because mm -hmm. it's like, okay, I, I'll have a thing where you, uh, you know, press this button and it plays an audio file. Okay, great. What if the player then pauses the game? Okay, I've got to, like, pause the audio file and then have that resume. And then what if the player quit, uh, quits out and then, oh, I need to, like, <laughs> save which ones they've... Oh, gee. And it's just, like, all of these things create huge headaches. Mm -hmm. And so it was, like, make the simplest possible version of this and, and throw it in the game. But I'm, I'm happy with it and I think it's cool. So at, at this point, are you... You're not changing anything about the game until release or the little things you're doing at this point? No, at this point, it's just um, because every time I make a build I have to then run through it to make sure the whole thing works yep. and so just to save my sanity it's like the game is done now because I'm sure there will be more things to do once the game is out people will find find bugs and stuff but I've been very um, very fortunate to have a group of uh, QA testers on the GMTK discord who have been running through it for these last few weeks and just uh, giving me really do add to that like final level of, of polish and completion. Yeah, it's, I think it's a, it's a good idea to, with all the playtesting you've been able to do, you've probably covered a lot of the problems many other people would face after launch already. I hope so, yeah. yeah. A, a lot, I've caught a lot of things. I had a, a demo on the Steam Next Fest and that you know, was quite good for just you know, the, the, the weirdest, wildest uh, feedback that you do not ever expect to get. That you know, <laughs> Some person is like, oh, I'm playing this on a you know, Dance Dance Revolution. Oh, there's a, a, a hint Pop up, maybe we could talk about that. Which I mean, is, let's, let's try you, it, see how it goes. Sure. Ooh. And it's, so it, it's timed, I think it's about sort of three or four minutes if you've been in this, the level for that long, then that's when that prompt comes up. And then it will never show you that prompt again for the rest of the game. So whether you take it or ignore it, it was basically just letting people know that there is a hint system in the game mm -hmm. rather than constantly being like, hey, you're, 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 you're being bad at this game. Let me Let me help you out. I just want people to be like, if it's there, if you need it, from now on, it's up to you. Well, I think it's helped me out here. Oh, so oh, wait, this wait, one's wait. quite a, a generous one. Hey, I think I did it. Hooray! Nice. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, that was quite a generous one because it's quite that was quite a tricky puzzle. I feel that was pretty tricky, especially especially when you're recording an interview at the same time. Oh, definitely. definitely, that's that's what we're blaming it on. That's the reason I couldn't solve that without the hint. <laughs> Yeah, continuing with the topic of release, I'm sure we'll see a video on GMTK about 
the whole release process and how it's going and all that kind of stuff? Do you have various videos planned out in advance? Yeah, I think so. There'll be a video just sort of uh, on release date. It's been like the game is here, it's available, go get it, please. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I just want to do like a big post-mortem of the whole process, all of the lessons I learned, all the mistakes I made, the mm -hmm. things that went well, the things that went wrong. And obviously, yeah, definitely looking at that that final release part. And, it, and it's also going to be an important time to talk about the things we talked about a bit earlier in terms of the advantages I've had making this game, because I feel like I've been very lucky to have people say that my this, this series has been influential on them to go make their own game. Mm -hmm. And I think it'd be kind of bad to then have the final video being like, yeah, the video, the game came out and it sold loads of copies and everyone played it and I'm really famous. And then people <laughs> being like, well, I followed this and I sold two copies. What the hell? I'd be like, no, no, I've got to, I've got to be like upfront about the fact that my experience is going to be different to yours. Sure. So, that's an important thing for me to cover. But yeah, I just wanna like, I definitely need to be able to draw a line under this whole process, uh, to be able to move on and make more games or make more videos and things like that. But uh, there's lots that I need to talk about and process and discuss with the, the, the thing before I can kind of feel like it's mm -hmm. finished and, and moved on. Because there, there is the whole weird thing with this of like the game, there's the game and then there's the series about the game and which thing is more important and even mm -hmm. though the game is done developing isn't done so i need to yeah. make sure that that is is properly finished yeah i was thinking about that so in your in your very first video that you did when you started this project the way you talked about it sounded like you were kind of looking for content for your video it's like i'm gonna make a game as a source for my videos and i'm curious if that that stayed the same no i think i think you're right i think it was the original idea was like, oh, I'm gonna make videos about the process of making a game and what the game is, is kind of irrelevant. You know, we'll figure that out later. That's just in the background and I can talk about that. And it's, um, and then, yeah, just as the game got bigger and more involved and as I got more interested in making it, it took on a life of its own. And then, yeah, the, the, the I've always definitely been uh, interested in the process of making it. And so that uh, won't go away, but I feel like maybe they've just sort of come up to the same level of importance in my mind. What, what's your instinct right now? Whether you, like, as soon as you've released this, you'll be thinking about the next game and what you want to make after that, or are you uh, gonna relax for a bit first? I'd definitely relax for a bit, and I'd like <laughs> to uh, focus more on the YouTube channel again for some time, just because I feel like over this whole year, I've, or, sorry, three years, I have, neglected YouTube a bit um, and so I'm looking forward to like just going back to being a YouTube guy with all of this new perspective and experience and stuff I can bring to the videos mm -hmm. but then I uh, definitely am curious to make more games I'm gonna say that it's not gonna be a big game I'm gonna make next time and it's gonna be a small game but mm -hmm. we saw how that happened with this one so there's every chance I'll make something uh, get myself stuck in a big project again but the, the plan is to focus on making smaller projects. Fair enough. Finally, I just want to ask, um, ha like, have you had time while you've been making this game and doing your videos to play other games? Has there been anything that you've played recently that particularly stood out to you? In terms of the, the thinky side of things, the more puzzly side of things, uh, this year I really enjoyed uh, Lorelei and the Laser Eyes. Mm, yeah, fantastic uh, game. Absolute puzzle stuffed game, just <laughs> absolutely but filled with riddles, just, it just felt like a sort of fractal pattern of just puzzles inside of puzzles, that was really good. Yeah. Um, uh, Animal Well was a uh, mm -hmm. uh, really good uh, Metroidvania type thing. I really liked uh, Botany Manor, which is um, Absolutely. sort of information type game, you know, um, sort of outer wildy type thing, but mm -hmm. in this very limited space of being in a little uh, sort of English manor growing plants and just sort of having to figure out the right circumstances for getting a plant to grow and doing those sort of puzzly things there. Uh, the Riven remake, boy, I did actually end up playing quite a lot of uh, puzzly things this year. And then Isles of S Isles of Sea and Sky was also... A, a oh yeah, you did a video on Isles of Sea and Sky, didn't you, as well? Which yeah, was yeah. Really great felt to like see. More of a, yeah. yeah, like a, a sort of hidden gem, that one. Yeah, fantastic game. I've played, played all of these as well and they're all amazing games. Um, nice. Hopefully you keep finding uh, some more to play after you've got this game out. 
Uh, you can just bury yourself in games yes. from now on. I mean, you've got to make the videos about something, right? Exactly. Yes. <laughs> now that you're not making one, you've got to play games to get even more uh, video inspiration. Oh, no, yeah. I haven't got the free content of <laughs> making my own video game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, all right. Thank you, Mark, for joining us. It's been great to chat. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And good luck with your, your launch. Excellent. Thank you. I hope, hope it goes well.